Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, today's webinar will be presented by myself, Andrea Copping, and Michaela Freeman. Um, we are with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, also representing Ocean Energy Systems Environmental. Today's webinar is about risk retirement for environmental effects of marine uh, renewable energy. What we'll be doing really is giving you uh, a summary of what OES Environmental has been working on really over the past year. Next slide, please. We're going to start with an introduction, a little background to the program for those of you not familiar. Spend the time we have really on the risk retirement process, an overview talking about data transferability and the one risk, retire, uh, risk we have been working on most recently, changes in oceanographic systems. And then really focus on the guidance documents, moving from science to making um, this information uh, available to regulators and then finish up with what our next steps are. Next slide, please. So specifically today, what we want to do is continue to engage the marine renewable energy community, anyone else who's interested. We're also very interested in your feedback, including the concepts of risk retirement and the guidance documents. So a little bit of housekeeping. We're going to suggest you keep your cameras off and we will, unless we're speaking, <clears throat> after this year and a half, I think we're all beginning to learn what works best for bandwidth for everyone and keep yourself muted. If you'd like to ask questions, it'd be great if you use the chat box in the lower right of your screen, should be on the lower right of your screen, uh, any time during the webinar and we'll address those. And if there's the opportunity, um, uh, we will also uh, open up mic so that you can ask questions orally. Um, I do want to note that this webinar is being recorded, and I hope that's all right with everyone, and it will be posted um, on the TETHIS webpage uh, a little while after we're finished. Okay, next slide. So uh, for those of you not familiar, OES Environmental was established by the International Energy Agency's Ocean Energy Systems back in 2010. Um, this is a task under OES and it's led by the US with the US Department of Energy's Water Power Technologies Office as the lead entity with several other US federal agencies. It's implemented by our laboratory, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And at the moment we have 16 countries participating. This is our phase four, just how long we've been going. Um, and the purpose of all these countries coming together really is to look at environmental effects of marine energy, but really the idea of advanced the industry in a responsible manner. The greatest um, product that we create during each of these phases, which are four years for us, is a state of the science report. And the most recent one came out in September of 2020, and you see the cover there, and it's of course available on TETHIS. Um, everything that OES does, all of our webinars, other products and so on are also available on TETHIS, which, and there's the URL there in case you're not familiar. Next slide, please. Uh, I think everybody on this call knows about marine renewable energy. It's energy obviously har harvested from moving water, waves, tides, currents, but we also need to remember the gradients, thermal and salinity gradients. We're still obviously in early stages of development, deployment and commercialization. And even after a decade or more of active work in this area, environmental concerns are continuing to slow consenting and permitting worldwide. Next slide, please. So why are environmental effects important? Why do we study them? We know why we're carrying out marine energy development. It's to mitigate climate change, produce secure local energy, and overall diversify the energy portfolio of most countries, especially those with coastal areas. But the concerns remain among regulators and stakeholders. And the reasons for those concerns is that these are new types of technology that have not been deployed before. We don't really know a lot about their effects. We have to remember that these are not empty ocean spaces. There are other users that need to be accommodated. And those marine animals and habitats we worry about the most for marine energy are also are already under a lot of stress from climate change and also other uh, human activities. So what's the solution to this? Carrying out coordinated research and making sure that that information is 
um, uh, addressed and, and spread widely through outreach can help to reduce the uncertainty around the environmental effects, ones we don't yet understand, leading to simplification and shortening of times to consent and deployment of both devices and as we start to look towards larger arrays. And we also feel that this information is incredibly useful to MRE developers in order to cite and develop technologies that will minimize uh, impacts. Next slide, please. Now we think of environmental effects of marine energy in terms of stressors and receptors, a la um, uh, uh, Bullard and Gill. Stressors being those parts of the marine energy devices and systems that might cause harm to parts of the environment and the receptors being the marine animals, the habitats and the processes that could be harmed. After about a decade of working on this, we've brought this down to about seven of these priority stressor receptor interactions. Not, no surprise to most of you on this call, collision risk with tidal blades, underwater noise from devices potentially affecting animals' communication, uh, electromagnetic fields from export cables and act, uh, activated parts of devices, changes in both benthic and pelagic habitats, uh, the potential for large animals like whales and sea turtles to encounter mooring lines to their uh, detriment, changes in oceanographic systems, which we'll talk about more today. This is changes in tidal um, ranges, circulation, uh, wave height, etc. And finally, the one we have not been able to get our hands around, displacement or barrier effects. This is moving animals that are on a migratory pathway or a normal movement to critical habitats, stopping them from reaching those habitats. And we haven't been able to investigate this because this is really only going to occur when we have many, many devices in the water. Next slide, please. Okay, at this point, I want to turn it over to Michaela to talk about risk retirement. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so a lot of the risk retirement uh, information we have talked about before. So I'm going to go over this relatively quickly. But there is a link at the top right of this slide, and you'll see Tethys links throughout the presentation. Um, so please go visit those. There's way more information on there as well as um, the link to our webinar, our yearly webinar we held last year, um, which goes through this in a little bit more depth. Um, but to overview risk retirement, uh, it's been used in the industry, but really with no definition. And so what we mean by risk retirement is that for certain interactions, potential risks need not be in fully investigated for every project. And here we're really talking small developments of one to four devices. Um, we are developing this to assist decision making and distinguish between perceived and actual risks, as well as to decrease uncertainty by relying on what's already known from the availability of similar or suitable data. So from consented projects, from research projects, or from analogous industries. By doing so, we think that potential risk can be retired for these smaller marine renewable energy installations. It is really important to note two things. One, that a risk can be re-examined in the future as more information becomes available, specifically as the industry moves towards larger arrays, there's likely a need to re-examine the effects that we may have considered retired. Um, and two, this doesn't change or replace any regulatory process, but it's really focused on making information more readily available. We developed this risk retirement pathway shown here to assess the ability to retire risks for MRE projects. And it leverages again, what's already known and what's available to streamline the consenting process. Um, we really aim to develop a systematic process to gather the information needed to consent a project, to assess a potential impact, analyze the information and determine if there is a risk and if it can be retired. Um, again, we've presented this in detail at last year's webinar, so I won't go too much into this as the recording is available from that on the page linked here. Um, but for those of you who haven't um, been here before, I want to just give a quick overview. The circles on the left start by identifying potential impacts or describing the project. Um, what Andrew was talking about is stressors, such as how many devices, what types of devices. Um, and then also describing the marine animals, habitats, and uses of the oceans or those receptors that occur in that same area. 
The rest of the pathway shows a series of stage gates to move through as checkpoints with off ramps where risk can be retired. So for example, the first stage gate guides the user through defining the potential risk of a project. Is there something about the device that might cause harm to the defined receptors? If it's determined that there's not a plausible risk, the off ramp shown with the down arrows can denote that that particular risk for that situation can be retired. However, if there's still a reasonable risk, you go on to stage gate two. At stage gate two, you examine existing data, assess if it provides enough information to determine if risk is no longer concern, and then again, off ramp if you can determine that uh, the risk can be retired or move through the pathway if not. At the end, this black arrow, uh, if, the, if the risk still can't be retired, it's important to consider redesigning the project, moving to another more suitable location, or even abandoning the project altogether if needed. Um, I do want to note at the top that there are dotted lines and arrows, which implies that there are feedback loops between and among these different stage gates. Um, in addition to risk retirement, um, well, kind of as I just mentioned in stage gate two, as part of risk retirement, it's really important to have access to relevant data and information. Uh, so we developed this data transferability process, which aims to make that existing information available. Um, we believe that data and information collected through research studies and monitoring from other projects should inform new marine renewable energy projects. And in addition, data and information from analogous industries may be used when impacts and effects are similar and comparable. We do recognize that some site-specific data will be needed for all new projects, but that existing data must be should be used as much as possible, and that data transfer can reduce some of those site-specific needs. Um, by data here, it could include raw or quality controlled data, but more likely comes in the form of analyzed or synthesized data, information, or reports. Um, and it's also important to note that data that's transferred should be collected consistently to allow for comparison. Uh, the figure on the right shows an overview of our data transferability process that includes a framework, a data collection consistency table, a monitoring data sets discoverability matrix that can be used to easily find available data and information and best management practices. Um, and to learn more about these different components, you can go to the link at the top right of the slide where it walks through each of the different parts. Um, it links to the actual matrix that you can go in and find available information. Um, and so, as I mentioned, overall, this data transferability is really a key aspect of our risk retirement process. So the next step in this process has been to understand the ability to actually retire potential risk. And so in doing so, we identified potential interactions that may be right for risk retirement. Uh, we began by compiling evidence bases that consisted of key research papers, monitoring reports and documents that could inform risk retirement for these small numbers of devices. Um, the evidence bases were compiled for four interactions, electromagnetic fields, underwater noise, habitat change, and changes in oceanographic systems. Each has been reviewed and discussed by experts through conference or online workshops and expert consultation. Um, and again, all the evidence bases can be found on risk retirement page on TETHIS, where you can find links to all the documents in each evidence base and more information about them. So far, we have looked at interactions we believe to have minimal risk. We've gathered evidence bases for these potential risks um, to describe how that information can be applied to new projects. Um, based on these efforts, we can consider the four risks we have focused on, shown here as retired for small numbers of devices. Um, we have presented before the information on underwater noise, EMF, and habitat change in last year's webinar. So I'm not going to go into detail about those today. Uh, instead, as Andrea mentioned, we'll focus on changes in oceanographic systems. Um, and so just to give you an idea of what we mean by considering it retired, it means that if a developer were to put forth a proposal in an appropriate location for one to four devices, 
perhaps there doesn't need to be a great deal of monitoring for these four interactions. Of course, there are certain caveats that come with this, um, such as the need to know what the sound output of new types of devices are for underwater noise, or where the unique and important habitats are to avoid those for habitat change. But overall, these are really an attempt to move towards doing things in a more standard manner so that each study doesn't need to be redone at every new site and new MRA deployment, of course, if the information shows us that risk can be retired. Um, again, you can find all the information on the three um, interactions we discussed at the recording of last year's webinar. But for now, I'm going to hand it back over to Andrea, who's going to walk us through changes in oceanographic systems. Thank you, Michaela. Um, so as Michaela said, we have uh, compiled evidence bases for those three risks that she mentioned we uh, reported on last year. In terms of changes in oceanographic systems, this took us a little bit longer because this is a little bit of a different take. Um, we are really looking at systems as opposed to an interaction of an individual animal or perhaps a small population with part of a device. Um, the uh, evidence base we've gathered is there at the thesis link on the bottom of this slide. I'd like to go to the next slide, please. Um, so in terms of what we know about oceanographic systems and how they are likely to interact with marine renewable energy, we have looked at the uh, kinds of field data that have been attempted. And it is very clear that changes in oceanographic systems from very small uh, de deployments are so small, they will not be detectable um, against the natural variability of the system. Um, and what we are primarily looking for here in tidal devices is, will the circulation of the water body be changed? Um, in wave devices, will the wave height be changed? And in both cases, there is potential if those changes occurred due to marine renewable energy devices, that sediment transport patterns would change, They're changing habitats, changing uh, shoreline erosion, et cetera. And then finally, if we think further, we have to worry about such things at a, at a water body level as changes in water quality, like dissolved oxygen, perhaps even changes in marine food webs. But at this point, we don't see those as being detectable for one to four devices. What we do know about changes in oceanographic systems, potential changes, comes from numerical models. Um, now, there's been many of these hydrodynamic models, both around tidal and wave installations, largely. Um, but, uh, of course, the modelers put many, many devices in the system so that they will get a model response. And these are not realistic of these early deployments. Uh, so, and it's also important to note that these models simply aren't validated. They may be well-validated hydrodynamic models, but they have not been validated for the effects of marine energy. Uh, development on those models. So we look at two kinds of effects, the first being near field effects, those that can be observed right around the device. Um, maybe a couple of uh, rotor lengths from the device, it really depends on the kind of device uh, you're talking about, especially with wave devices. And these tend to be localized changes, but they are likely to have little impact on the larger water body. Far field effects are those that would be observed further from the device. And this is where you might get changes in the wave climate, the tidal range, the circulation, et cetera. And these are the, uh, the issues we need to be on alert for as we go to large arrays um, and uh, perhaps these sort of secondary knock-on effects. Next slide, please. So we've just done some of these drawings. You may recognize some of them if you're familiar with the state of the science. These are actually new ones. This is simply our means of trying to visually represent what happens uh, in the event of a uh, wave climate uh, on a shoreline, in this case, a sandy shoreline. What happens when you put a series of wecks offshore? The wave height will decrease moving towards shore and the longshore current uh, depositing sediment may be changed. It depends a little bit on what the local uh, drift cells look like. But that's overall the, the issues that we're concerned about. Next slide. Similarly, if you had an array of tidal devices, um, and we had a great deal of trouble working with our illustrator to really um, uh, be able to visually show this simply. We are, we are trying to imply that as um, current tidal currents go by uh, 
tidal devices, you will get decreased current downstream, increased bypass current, vortices shed off the ends of the blade, and essentially a wake effect from uh, a number of turbines. There is still a great deal of uh, discussion within the industry of what that wake effect looks like and how it interacts among turbines, but the concern once again could be in terms of sediment transport patterns changing and eventually perhaps these secondary effects of changes in water circulation, um, uh, tidal velocity, etc. Next slide, please. So we've gathered all this evidence together. There are a great many papers on numerical models, and we had to pick those that seemed the most relevant um, for actually having these, examining these, inter, uh, these environmental interactions. And what that evidence base does is it suggests that changes in oceanographic systems from small developments aren't detectable as we expected. We went, took this, we've written a white paper and taken it to a number of experts who concur that, the, that although this, these devices can be modeled, these systems can be modeled, we cannot see differences, small numbers. So with that in mind, we feel that we can retire this risk of ocean to changes to oceanographic systems from small deployments. So as uh, Michaela pointed out, this means that for a new uh, um, project, developers should not be required to go out and prove this and to go out and carry out a field campaign that is not going to show anything. However, we know that as we move to arrays, we do need to revisit this risk. We do need to improve our model validation with field measurements around deployed devices as we get to multiple devices. We need also need to be thinking about cumulative effects. How does putting a large, say, wave or tidal array in an area that may make changes to um, oceanographic systems, how does this interact with other anthropogenic activities, shoreline development, um, other structures offshore, et cetera? And we need to know how these changes will affect specific habitats and species, particularly likely to be affecting benthic species. So our recommendations is that we continue to work with the regulators in the industry to uh, understand this risk and to put forward this information, the evidence base, as I showed you, is available to show that this is not a necessary uh, risk to investigate at the small level, but um, plan for the array development. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm still doing this right, yes. Um, okay, so I'd just like to summarize what you've heard so far. Um, and I do want to encourage you to type any questions into the chat box you might have, just direct them to everyone. Um, so we have been working on this risk retirement data transferability process, trying to make information available that will support uh, decision-making this is not going to take the place of any kind of um, uh, regulatory guidance and certainly not any statutes or rules, but simply there as a resource to help with decision making, to help access uh, available data. Um, we reported on this last year, but just to remind you, there is a matrix of data sets that is searchable and discoverable um, as and as data sets for consented or uh, permitted projects are added worldwide, they're added to that matrix, and it's available on TETHIS to help make it easy to access those similar data sets and apply them to new projects. So based on the feedback we've had working with um, experts in the field, we feel that risks from underwater noise, EMF, habitat change, and changes in oceanographic systems can and should be retired for single devices or small arrays, more or less one to four devices, really depends on the size and the type of device. Um, but there's certainly more understanding that we can continue to gain. And as devices get in the water, robust monitoring programs can really set us up to understand what will, is likely to happen at larger scale arrays. Um, and we have other stressors, of course, that we have not been able to um, sort of put through this process yet, most notably collision risk. We intend as OES Environmental to put a considerable focus on uh, collision risk and how we might sort of chew down that, that um, uncertainty over this next year. This is, of course, a very, very tough one. We're trying to prove that animals will not collide with blades. Okay, next slide. Um, so, 
as I mentioned, um, OES Environmental's purpose is to move the industry forward in a responsible manner. So what do we need to do this? First and foremost, we need more devices in the water so we can collect data, test scientific hypotheses, and validate our numerical models. We have, are trying to go about this by the systematic sharing of information, TESIS, which you've uh, hopefully for familiar with, and you've certainly heard us talk about. I also want to note that in the U.S. we have brought together TETHIS with many other data um, portals and uh, uh, data uh, bases into a system called Primer that is trying to address everything associated with marine energy from environmental to resource characterization, technologies, engineering, uh, model codes, etc. Through OES Environmental, we have developed an organized way to transfer data and information to identify the right information, gain that information and apply it. And we have tried to put forward a deliberative process for risk retirement so that it can be done in a consistent manner. So the very last piece of this, which I'm gonna ask Michaela to address in a moment, is really to take this science we've been looking at and translate it into a much more accessible and available means for um, applying to regulatory guidance. So next slide, and I'll let uh, Michaela talk about that. Thanks, Andrea. So as you mentioned, the next step in the process is the development of what we're calling guidance documents, which are aimed at regulators who are consenting and licensing projects, advisors who are assessing the information and informing the regulators and developers as they're prepar preparing these fit for purpose applications. The purpose, as Andrea mentioned, is really to move from the scientific evidence to application in a regulatory context and to provide guidance for these applications internationally. One of the main goals of the guidance documents is to simplify the search for data with which to assess potential effects and determine the feasibility to retire risks. Um, it's important to note, again, that these guidance documents do not replace any regulation or national guidance, but they're really meant to be a useful tool in the process. The guidance documents are guided by categories of regulations and includes an overview of the applying these concepts in a regulatory process. And I'll speak more about both of these in the next slides. Um, this figure kind of on the right is a shortened version of something I'll show later, but just gives you an overview of the structure of the guidance documents. There are three types of aspects within the guidance documents. First, a background document that provides the backbone of this effort. It explains the purpose and the application of the information and the regulatory categories used. It's broadly applicable internationally and it's been developed in conjunction with Aquaterra as well as feedback from our OES environmental country representatives. There's also country specific documents, which are being developed for each of our OES environmental countries. And these are aimed to provide a needed level of specification so that the guidance documents can be applied in each country as the rest of them are more applicable internationally. Uh, lastly, there's the stressor specific documents that present an overview for each stressor. They link to available data and information and they detail where we're at with risk retirement. This includes information from the evidence bases, the OES Environmental 2020 State of the Science Report, and that monitoring data sets discoverability matrix that we've talked about. Um, so first, I am going to go through the four regulatory categories that we use. And this is really the basis of translating between the scientific evidence and the application for consenting and licensing. These four categories are species and or populations at risk, which may include endangered, threatened, and vulnerable species, economically valuable species, and culturally significant species. Next, we have habitat alteration or loss, which includes impacts to essential, critical, or vulnerable, vulnerable habitats, as well as larger protected ecosystems. There's also effects on water quality, which can include changes in water circulation, wave heights and current speeds, changes in oceanographic system and contamination from devices. And then lastly, we have effects on social and economic systems, including impacts to employment opportunities, social services, health and well-being, and commu community impacts, to name a few. 
Um, and so the background document provides descriptions of each of these categories, as well as relevant information for consenting processes, such as baseline information needs and potential risks. And it includes information on risk retirement within each of these four categories and a brief notes on caveats, as well as cumulative effects. Um, and I do wanna note that these categories were developed as we think that each of the stressor receptor interactions, the potential impacts from MRI devices, fit within these four categories, which span most of the regulation. And again, we worked with our OES environmental country representatives, um, and there is agreement that these are kind of the general basis that, um, that regulations fall within these four different categories. So next within the guidance documents, in the background document, we have that description of the four categories. We've also developed a flow chart, and I'm gonna describe it in these next two slides. It is um, quite a bit of information. It's very detailed, so I'm not gonna go through the entire flow chart, but I do wanna give you an idea of what this looks like. We developed this um, flow chart or the process for applying the guidance documents to show application of risk retirement to consenting processes, including key stressors and receptors for consideration, when and which OES environmental resources can be used, risk retirement, data transferability, um, our TTHIS knowledge base, um, when those can be used to gather relevant data and which steps are relevant for regulators, advisors, and developers. So this is just one half of our overarching um, framework here. And I've grayed out some of the areas since it's a lot of detail here, but I just wanted to show um, kind of simplify it a second so that we can look at the overarching categories. So here we start with project scoping in any environmental consenting process. Um, and this includes identifying environmental effects, looking at available data for transfer, if we can retire or manage risks, and then checking that all the necessary components have been identified. Um, and so these are the main categories. And then I'm gonna show you the rest of the flowchart as you can see why I've graded out. It's um, quite detailed, but on the left, you'll see that we've identified the stressors and receptors that are key. And then those have been matched to those four regulatory categories. So this provides the basis for bridging between the scientific information, stressors and receptors, how we talk about it in the marine renewable energy industry and community, and then going to the regulatory process. What are those four different regulatory categories that match on to that? Um, and then in the other side on the right, you can see where the data transferability process, risk retirement fits within this initial scoping um, that would need to be completed by developers um, or potential for cons consultation with regulators or advisors. Um, and so we've tried to break down this process and um, see how we can apply the different aspects that we've been creating. So this is just the first part of the framework. The second part is a little bit simpler. Um, here you can see it walks through that application submitted by the developer, um, regulators and advisors evaluating the information where again, data transferability and risk retirement come into play, and then the potential for a request for additional data collection, what those might be if it's a baseline data collection, if it's prior to consent, if it's post installation monitoring, and then the decisions made on that project. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, we really tried to create this framework so that it's, um, or the background document and associated framework, so that it's applicable internationally. It uses language that's relevant across countries. Um, so this is a bit of a simplified version of consenting processes, but our hope is that it includes enough detail to guide users through the application of these concepts from project scoping to the end of project licensing. So the next aspect of the guidance documents are the country specific documents. The goal here is to develop these for each of the 15 OES environmental countries working with our country representatives to do so. These documents include information on regulatory jurisdictions, agencies or regulatory bodies that have jurisdiction over marine renewable energy projects, key regulations and statutes for environmental effects based on the four categories I showed, and additional relevant information for that country, such as marine spatial planning or adaptive management. I do wanna note that these documents are not meant to be a comprehensive overview of all the regulations and details, 
but rather are meant to provide an overview of jurisdiction and regulation that can help guide a developer who's putting a project in the water and be a reference for regulators and advisors. On the next two slides, I'm gonna very quickly show portions of the guidance documents from the US document to give an idea of what these look like. Um, to keep the documents digestible, we've really used tables to show the information and included footnotes with references and links throughout the document so it's easy to find additional information. So here I am going to walk through um, the US example. The first table shows the regulatory jurisdiction in the US. It's split by areas under state jurisdiction and federal jurisdiction. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail on these, but I just wanted to give everyone an idea of what these look like. Table two here uh, shows the main federal agencies that have jurisdiction in the US. So for the Marine Renewable Energy License, uh, for a seabed lease and for the environmental assessment, you have, um, different relevant statutes and agencies that are responsible here. Uh, and again, this is walking through what a developer might need to know for consenting processes and who would be the responsible party to uh, work with. Oops, apologies. Uh, these next tables, three and four here, um, show examples of the information for each of the four regulatory categories. So the top is species and populations at risk. Um, and then the bottom one is for habitat alterations or loss. So for the top one, um, we have two main agencies um, here, and it's mainly consultation that are needed if there's a concern about impacting an endangered species or a marine mammal. Um, the bottom table with habitat loss, you have the same main agencies that are responsible. And again, it's mainly consultation um, if habitat may be adversely impacted. And that is what the developer would need to do, consult with these different agencies with um, the different um, responsible parties. So again, just providing a really, really quick overview um, of these. So apologies for not going into too much detail, but wanna make sure, sure to get through all the information we have today. So last, I wanna show um, a quick overview of how all of these documents fit together. Um, and where we are in the process. So, so far at the top, you can see we have the background document. Again, that provides the backbone of the effort. It explains our goals and what we mean with the guidance documents. Um, we've completed the background documents, which has those descriptions of the regulatory categories and the framework that I showed. Um, and we have also completed under stressor specific documents, the underwater noise and electromagnetic fields documents. And we're in the process of having our habitat change and changes in oceanographic systems documents reviewed by our OES environmental country representatives. For country specific documents, we've completed the US document, which I just uh, showed an example of, and we have draft versions of several others shown here, which all of our OES environmental country representatives um, are working to complete and have drafted those for us. Um, those shown in gray, we'll start drafting once we've completed all the other pieces above. As Andrea mentioned, we have a bit of a way to go on collision risks um, for risk retirement. And so we will develop that um, in the future. Um, before I go any further on this, I know I just presented a lot of information. So please don't forget to type your questions um, in the chat box to us so that we can make sure to get through those when we are done here in just a few slides. Um, and then a really important aspect of all of this is making sure that we have been making this development of the guidance documents an iter iterative and collaborative process that engages the international marine renewable energy community. We want to make sure that we're developing these documents so that they're useful for regulators, for advisors, and for developers, um, and that there's review, exchange, feedback throughout the entire process. Um, each aspect of the guidance documents have gone through a feedback and review process. Um, first with the OES environmental analysts, um, the country representatives to review. Um, then we worked with international regulators to talk about kind of the overarching guidance documents, what we presented here today. First with um, working with some US regulators and advisors, we've presented to the UK regulators and advisors, as well as a more specific 
Welsh Marine Renewable Energy community. Um, and then of course, engaging the broader international community and the public through things such as webinars here today. Um, and so we really wanna make sure this is iterative for all aspects of the guidance document process that um, we're constantly getting feedback on this and making it as useful as possible. So we look forward to your questions today and your feedback. So please don't forget to put those in the chat. And I am going to hand it back to Andrea to present the last few slides. Um, thanks so much, Michaela. Okay, so our next steps, um, as I noted earlier, and Michaela did as well, we are going to try to work on risk retirement for collision risk. Um, we have, uh, we had a couple of workshops in the spring with experts from around the world trying to understand what the uh, data gaps are, what the real uh, gaps in our understanding and ability to model these interactions. And they sort of fall into two main categories. We really need more data collection of animals in close proximity to devices, especially tidal devices or big river devices. And as many of you know, the technologies for um, observing these devices, these uh, device animal interactions, things like underwater cameras and active acoustics aren't always well developed. They don't operate particularly well in these very high energy turbid areas. So that's quite a quite a, uh, uh, a challenge, but there are groups around the world working actively on this. And while there are a series of collision risk and encounter risk models that are used, most adapted from seabirds and or birds and wind turbines, uh, they aren't entirely fit for purpose. So trying to improve upon those models is necessary too. Um, we have also been uh, working on some very, fairly basic information on marine renewable energy and environmental effects. We, uh, using the 2020 state of science, we've made a number of sort of derivative project products and one of them at the request of the regulators in a number of other countries is a brochure and essentially training materials, particularly for new regulators. Just as this industry is increasing and there is a demand for um, researchers with specific talents, uh, new companies forming, there is also a lot of pressure being put on regulators worldwide to um, assess applications. Um, so the, many countries are bringing regulators on at a great rate, still not fast enough for many I know. Um, and there really is a need to be able to have information available for that primary training of those uh, regulators. Um, the other thing that we are doing through OES Environmental, we have been working on this risk, risk retirement issue for a number of years. And while there's more to do, I think we're sort of rounding the corner a little bit. And we have uh, gone through a process to identify new topics we will address over the next few years. Uh, there are four of them. We did this through sort of a nomination and voting process with all the countries involved. The first is how do we think about scaling from uh, interactions and risks of single devices up towards larger arrays? How does an animal or a group of animals or a habitat interact, not just with one device, but with many? We are also starting a process to look at cumulative effects of marine renewables with other anthropogenic activities. It's not just multiple wave farms together, but multiple wave farms and how they might interact with shipping, offshore oil and gas, shoreline development, and so on uh, to, to produce an environmental effect. The third topic really is trying to look bro more broadly at the ecosystem effects and ecosystem services um, associated with marine renewables. How we have tried to think about individual stressors and populations or animals or habitats. How do we start to think about this at the larger scale? And the fourth is this issue of displacement of marine animals. As I mentioned earlier, we can't really investigate this till we have a lot more devices in the water, but we need to be really thinking about how this plays out. Um, and, and the other thing we have um, started this year and will continue is we're really bringing um, issues of environmental effects of marine energy in the tropics and subtropical areas into focus. We have tended to be very sort of temperate northern hemisphere biased because that's where the majority of the countries involved in uh, marine energy development uh, live, but we realize there is a great deal more interest in tropical countries and many of the ecosystems differ tremendously and actually the um, devices uh, differ. We will start to be looking at things such as ocean thermal energy conversion, smaller wave devices and so on. 
Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is where we'd really like to uh, thank you, have you uh, get involved. Uh, we're gonna pause here for a moment. You'll see a QWERTY um, symbol on your screen. If you use your smartphone, it will take you to a survey. We are really interested in trying to gather more of your feedback, particularly on what's of interest and importance. The URL is up there if you can't uh, pull it up by the, by the QR code. Um, so uh, we're just going to pause for one minute before we finish, allow you to at least, you don't have to do the survey now, but get, allow you to get to it, and also to think about um, some questions. So we're just going to take about a two-minute pause. The As I noted, the slides, this is being recorded, and you will receive a copy along with a set of the slides uh, in a few days, so that if you don't catch this now, you'll be able to do it then. But please, we, we entreat you, please uh, get on the survey. It's very simple, and uh, give us your feedback. So just wait for about two minutes. Yeah. And for those of you who haven't used a QR code before, if you pull up your smartphone and go to your camera and just point it at the QR code, it'll pop up a link that will pull up at the top of your screen that you can click and it'll take you right to the survey. Of course, maybe a little more straightforward to click on the link here, um, but the QR code is pretty handy if you haven't used it before. And uh, also feel free if you don't wanna send your questions to the larger group, you can send them directly to um, Debbie, Rose, Andrea, or myself. So feel free to send them to any of us. Um, Andrea, I see we have one. Do we wanna go ahead and start so with let's that? Let's wait about another minute and then okay. start with All right, I think we'll go ahead with the questions. And again, you'll be sent the link later. So if you don't wanna do it at this moment, you can pull it up on your smartphone or you'll be sent the link later. Um, so we do have one question that was sent to everyone. Um, it says, I was wondering how the guidance documents will be used. So for example, does a developer propose it to the consenting authority when starting the consenting process? or will they rather inform the regulatory framework of the consenting process? And should it be taken into account at the political level? Um, and they're very keen to disseminate the guidelines here in Europe, which is wonderful. So thank you for that. Andrea, do you wanna take a stab at that question? Um, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, thanks, Lada. Um, uh, we really see these guidance documents as hopefully being usable at several levels. Um, to address the sort of policy political level, we think that just getting a quick overview that, that this sort of exists is probably a great idea. And we will be providing some fairly simple guidance that could be used with the policy level of, of your agencies. We really hope the, the parts that um, Michaela walked through in the various actual documents. By the way, these documents are short. They're two to four pages. They're not big tomes. So we're the point is to make them very accessible with lots of links and so on. We hope that these would be usable both by a developer as they to review before they sit down for their initial visit with a regulator uh, pre-consenting. We hope that the regulators, particularly those who are new to the field, would find them useful. Um, and um, if you noted that when Michaela walked through it, there are several places we see that these, this work comes in, um, the links to TTHIS, the links to some of the other data, et cetera. So we think we really are trying to span that space, I guess is what we'd say. Um, and we would be more than happy to work with you to help disseminate these in Europe, to provide uh, a webinar for uh, specific groups if you think that's useful. And we are extremely interested, especially as we move forward with the country documents, to get um, feedback from those uh, working in the regulatory and policy space in those countries to see that we've got it right. 
Um, yeah, and so the next question was, are the already finalized guidance documents already published or will they be published together? So we did have in our presentation a link to the TFIS page for the guidance documents. Um, if you can't remember any link today, just remember the risk retirement link because you can find everything else there. You can find the evidence bases, the guidance documents, all of that on the risk retirement page. Um, but we do have a link there and we have that nice um, overview of the guidance documents, the different orange, green, blue diagram. And from there, you can click on each of the finished uh, documents that we have. And if one is still, if there's one we're still drafting, as you try and click on it and hover over it, a little note will pop up letting you know that. Um, but they are all available on TFIS, those that are finished. And Debbie just um, put the link in the chat. Yes, thank you, Debbie. So those are up there. That page will be continually updated as we go. Um, it does take a little bit of time for us to kind of finalize a document. As we've said, we have a really good review process. So we put the document together, oftentimes with the help of Aquaterra. Um, we send it to our OES environmental country representatives for them to review. And if they feel it's needed, they'll often reach out to experts in their country or their regulators in their country to provide a review. Um, and then if needed, we'll go to additional experts as well. And then after all that feedback, we'll um, complete it and put it up on TIPA. So it does take a bit of time to finalize the documents. And when I say finalize, I don't mean finalize and that it'll never be touched again. Um, as I mentioned, this is really an iterative process. So any feedback we get today, we might incorporate into the guidance documents, even in the documents that are already quote unquote finalized. Um, so these documents are already being, are always being developed and updated. And I see we have some more questions here. Um, question, when will the Oceanographic Systems white paper be available? Mm -hmm. um, great question. It's actually available as a draft now. I'm not sure if it's up on TETHIS. We can put it up there. Um, we are turning that into a journal article just because we thought it might get a little more play. So we're in the process there. But the draft uh, paper is available now. And if it's not up on TETHIS, we can certainly put it there. Um, another question. Um, are we going to assess specific stressor receptor interactions for ocean thermal energy conversion and salinity gradients? Um, great question. Um, as I mentioned, as we're starting to look more at tropical and subtropical um, ecosystems uh, that marine energy is being put into, and we are, uh, this is partly, I will, uh, much to our shame, be prompted by those uh, countries that have uh, joined us as OES environmental who are tropical and for whom tidal and wave are much less important. Um, I think we will be doing this for sure for OTAC. Um, salinity gradients might lag a little further behind because it's not quite as well developed, although I learned the other day there is a pilot plant being uh, deployed in Colombia. So um, yes, I think that will be on our agenda in future. Another question about, is there any STEM content for kids or youth? Do you wanna talk about that, Michaela? Yeah, absolutely. So um, last year after we published the 2020 State of the Science, we've really pushed for developing these uh, STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, so these products for kind of younger students um, ranging from well, in the U.S., we call them um, like kindergarten. So those who are, I think, around age four or five, Andrew, let me know if I'm incorrect on that, um, all the way through middle school, high school, and then um, university students, both undergraduate and graduate students. <clears throat> and so obviously the content varies quite a bit from those, but we're developing coloring pages based off um, some of those illustrations you saw in the presentation today to uh, engage the younger STEM crowd all the way to presentations for university students on this information, why it matters, why it's important. Um, and then we're also developing a marine renewable energy kind of environmental effects overview brochure. The aim is to give it to regulators who are new to the marine renewable energy industry as a sort of um, training material, really just to give them a quick um, overview of what we're looking at here. But we think it might also be useful for kind of that older STEM audience and for the public. So we may take it and make it 
less uh, regulatory jargony and make it into something available to the public. So great question. Hey, I we have an we have another question here. Great question for Bill Staubi. Can you please describe the process for acquiring data sets? Do they all reside on TFIS anywhere else? And then asking about efforts to disseminate data. Let me take the first part and you take the second sure. part, uh, Michaela. So um, uh, we didn't cover it in this um, webinar specifically, but um, at the request of regulators, when we first presented some of this data transferability and risk retirement, um, we heard from regulators in the U.S. and elsewhere that acquiring the data sets is the hard part. How do you know? Where are they? With, in response to that, we've developed a matrix. It's a searchable uh, database that allows you to search for data sets um, using certain kinds of filters or criteria. For example, is it a wave or a tidal? device you're interested in. What's the sort of environment is it going into? Is it an open coast? Is it an enclosed embayment, a narrow channel? Um, and there, uh, Debbie's just posted the, the link to it in the in the chat. Um, and then what sorts of animals do you believe to be at risk? And that will narrow it down to available data sets. Now, the data sets that are actually in the matrix, they are not the data sets, they are the metadata. Um, but they describe what those data look like. They provide where there is a download link available, that is there. Where there is not a specific download link, they provide a contact person and generally an email um, or a link to a website where you can go to and get those data. So we've done our best to make them as available as possible. I need to note that that matrix is not very full yet, simply because there are not that many data sets. Now the data sets we're really focusing on are those that have been used in already consented projects, or in some cases, some that went most of the way through the process, but may not have succeeded in getting a license in the end. So those are all there. Um, and hopefully that as we, as the industry grows, that matrix will grow. We stay up on that pretty well. Um, Michaela, do you wanna briefly address the dissemination of this kind of thing? Yes, absolutely. And I should mention that the evidence bases, which aren't the data sets, um, but are the key reports and monitoring information, those are also all available on TFIS as well. Um, yes, so for as far as disseminating all of this information, we are always sending out our bi-weekly TETHIS blast, which has data, reports, information in it, um, new articles. And so that is a great place to find a lot of this information and how we disseminate a lot of things, whether it's um, notifying people of the webinars or um, oftentimes of new um, data transferability uh, risk retirement processes that we're working on. Um, as far as the guidance documents specifically, as I mentioned, we have presented this to um, regulators in the UK. Uh, specifically, we did a session with the marine renewable energy uh, industry community in Wales, as they're very interested in the risk retirement process, and they have a lot of um, applications for devices going in. Um, and so, as Andrea mentioned, we're happy to conduct a similar webinar or workshop with regulators uh, worldwide. Um, we've had um, asked to do it in Canada and other places, so we're hoping to engage regulators in that way. Um, we are also looking as we develop the guidance documents that these become kind of part of the training materials as well. And I use training materials very loosely. Um, this is information that they can use to hopefully make their lives easier um, and find available data and information. And so that kind of MRE overview brochure that we um, that I mentioned briefly in the outreach, as well as the guidance documents will all be part of that. Um, in the US specifically, we have contacted a few uh, regulators from each of the agencies that may have jurisdiction, and we are engaging with them to ask them to review the guidance documents, especially the U.S. country-specific information, and kind of conduct some feedback and review that way. Um, so we're really open to doing it different ways, whatever are suitable in different countries, um, and we are... Um, more than happy to provide additional webinars and whatnot. Andrew, is there anything I missed there in our dissemination? No, I think that's great. Um, well, I'd like to thank everybody. We've run a little bit over time, some great questions. There may be a few more we need to answer offline. 
but um, thank, uh, thank you to everybody who's there and you can contact me or Michaela at any time. Our emails are there or through Tethys. And I'd like to thank everybody for being here today. Also recognize our much larger group at PNNL and through the other 15 OESE countries without whom this would not be possible. Also great thanks to the US Department of Energy's Water Power Technologies Program and Ocean Energy Systems for the support that allows us to bring these webinars to you. So with that, I think we'll sign off and thank you very much for joining us. Yes, thank you. And please don't forget to fill out the survey. Thanks, everyone.